according to Abraham. If somebody was going to preach on that, what do you think their text might be? My text this morning, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody use Romans chapter 4, but that's my text this morning. And I'm going to pick some things out of there that really, uh, I couldn't get away from this week as I was studying. I just, there are times when I can, because we try to do our devotions every day, and so there are times when I read, and I can just kind of brush over certain things, and chapter 4 of Romans, I couldn't get out of it. I read it like, I don't know how many times this week, just, I couldn't get out of it. So I want to start uh, in prayer. Father, we just lift up the name of Jesus this morning. We lift up your word. God, your word is powerful. Lord, it's more powerful than any two-edged sword. Because it not just gets down to the joints and the marrow of the bone like a sword, but God, it goes all the way down to the soul and divides the soul and the spirit. Lord God, and I pray this morning that you would move in your word and move in this service. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would completely shut me up and take over. And let your word go forth <clears throat> in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 4. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the, pertaining to the flesh, has found? Obviously he's referring to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, Abraham shows, for, through verses 21 through 31, that both Jews and Gentiles could only be saved by grace through faith. Pardon me. I wonder if I should put a throat... or You know, I'm going to get some water. Because I don't want to do that again. That was loud. I apologize. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What was that? A UFO. So Abraham shows in Romans 3, verses 21 through 31, that both Jews and Gentiles could only be saved by grace through faith. Um, in verse 28 it says therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law the interesting thing here is that when we look at Abraham we're looking at a man who precedes the law what I mean by that is the law came through whom? Moses and this was after Abraham and all the children of Israel. So, Abraham precedes the law. Whatever Abraham does is before the law, and it is established. It's, it's interesting that Abraham is the one that the Jews call their father, Father Abraham. But it's interesting, is he not also the father of all the Arab nations? And so when God made a promise to Abraham that he was going to have descendants innumer innumerable it was all of his descendants so God has God has spoken some things and I, I did a sermon a while back on the genealogies and a lot of times we look at that and it's mundane but there's a purpose to it and I tried to bring out the purpose because when God spoke to certain people and said your line will go on and your line will stop when you look at the genealogies, you see where one line continues to the Messiah and where the other line all of a sudden is cut off. So when God speaks, God means it. So Abraham, and, and, and the concept I wanted to bring out, I don't see too well. I'm looking at this thinking it's Hebrew, but it is exactly the scripture that I wanted to read. Habakkuk 2.4, it says, But the just shall live by his faith. That's Old Testament. Because a lot of times we get the concept that, that faith is a New Testament concept. And that the Jews were the chosen people of God, and they were the only ones that could receive salvation. And through the Jews came the law. Through the Jews came the prophets. Through the Jews came the word. But that's not necessarily so because even in the Old Testament they had to live by their faith. And, it, and as you look through history you can see that when the children of Israel were obedient to God God's hand of blessing was upon them. And when the children of Israel walked away from God God's, had, God's hand of blessing was pulled from them. 
And so in a sense, we do see kind of a, a reaping sowing in the Old Testament. However, when it comes to salvation, it's always been by faith. And I wanted to draw that point out from the Old Testament. <clears throat> also, Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see there that God has to give you the faith or the grace to receive the faith. The grace is not of you. The faith is not of you. They are the gift of God. And so God gives you the grace to have the faith that he gives you to receive salvation in Jesus Christ. So it's not of works. So we'll go to verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to glory about, but not before God. It doesn't matter what we do. A lot of us can get a little bit of cocky in some of the victories that we've had. But we have nothing to boast about at the face of God. Because God, everything we have has been given to us by God. For what does the scripture say? Of Abraham believed God, and that was accounted unto him for righteousness. That to me is the key text. That's the key verse. And the word, to me, is Abraham believed. I want to hinge on that point as I go through this chapter. But I want to hinge on the word, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And I'll change that to the word that. <coughs> because, sorry, that's what he's speaking of is that belief. Abraham was not made right before God by doing good, by doing what God said. Well, you know, let's go on and read a little bit further. Because we know that in these times when Paul is writing this scripture, it's early in his ministry and he's anxious because Rome is the center of the world at the time. And he's very anxious to go to Rome. He's very anxious to preach the word <coughs> in Rome to the Romans because of the effect he believed God wants him to have there. Now it says here, Abraham believed God, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It is said that in the book of Romans, if that was the only book of the Bible you'd have, you would be able to become a Christian, and you would have all the doctrines of Christianity in that one book. So as you read through here, you're going to see him touch on several things. Because he dealt in Galatians with the Judaizers very heavily. And they followed him everywhere he went in his missionary journeys. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it says that Abraham believed God and that was accounted to him for righteousness. His belief in God. <clears throat> Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without sin or without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. By the way, this comes out of, if you're taking notes, Psalm verse 32, verses 1 through 2. He's quoting here where David said, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sins. Now, David... Abraham, we stated, was preceded the law. David was under the law. And David understood faith outside of the law is what brings a person. David had, an, had a, I, I can kind of relate to David because in my own life I'm the youngest. David was the youngest. David was sent out in the field to watch the sheep and the goats. And David spent his time just communing with God. He just had the presence of God with him as a child and spent his time singing and learning different musical instruments as he was out in the... What are you going to do if you're a shepherd out in a field? There's a lot of dead time there. <clears throat> so instead of wasting his time, he utilized it in his relationship to God to worship God, to draw closer to God, 
And the Bible says in Psalm that David always saw God at his right hand. So when it came time to see a giant, no matter how big the giant was, God at his right hand is always bigger. So there was no problem there. There was no worry. And I'm getting off on a tangent, but I don't care because I think it's important to bring the interesting point out because we are talking about faith. And if you want to see somebody who's faith, full of faith, see David. See him stand before the giant. See him knowing what God told him. And as Saul chased him around after the giant, trying to kill him, and twice he was in the cave and had the opportunity to kill him, and his friends said, kill him and get it over with. And he said, God anointed me king, and it's God's job to put me on the throne, not mine. I will not touch God's anointed. David did not dare move beyond his circumstance to take God's promise to him in his own hands. Okay? The circumstance doesn't necessarily matter, but we are not to take things in our own hands. When God has spoken, we are to have faith in God and believe what God had said. But even before then, David understood the principle. And when David went down to see Goliath, he had a sling and he took five smooth stones. Why did he take five smooth stones? My opinion is because Goliath, which was one of the Anakim, and that's a whole other story there, had four brothers. David was ready for, David was ready for all five. He didn't think he was going to miss. He knew he wasn't going to miss. He was a sharpshooter. You look at the interesting thing when you look through history and you start reading through 1st and 2nd Samuels, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and you look at all these men and all the things that went on in the Old Testament, there were different tribes, had different specialties, and David was a sling shooter. And they, they said at 100 yards, now probably 50, they could hit a, a hair's breadth. That's, that's, I mean, target practice. These guys were better than a lot of handgunners today or shooters today with a slingshot. And so, and, and you understand if you have any area of specialty in your life that you can train the human mind to do things and you can become a special, you know, have a special area where you're really good at what you do. Tim Paul does upholstery. I don't know of very many people that can do upholstery as good as him. And it's amazing to watch him at work. But that's his specialty. That's his thing. You know, I have things that I can do. I'm, I'm a pretty good truck driver. Okay? Big deal. But I mean, I take pride in my work. And so, you know, I can do some things that other people can't. I learn some tricks. And so every one of us has learned tricks and learned to do our thing our way. And if somebody would follow you to work, no matter who you are in this house, we would probably be amazed at how good you are at work. Because we would see you in your element. And this is David in his element with a slingshot. And so I believe that he took five stones because he was ready for the family. He didn't care. He had no doubt. And he knew that the hand of God was on him. And I believe that because of his relationship to God, the Holy Spirit was with him and the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. There's a lot in the scripture, understand, that we don't see, that we don't hear. But when you start to look at these people and you see their relationship, it's amazing what goes on. So we see Abraham, who precedes the law, is justified by his faith. We see David, who is under the law, is justified by his faith and not by the works. And then he, he goes into this further, pardon my old Bible. <laughs> but I'm not going to get a new one because all my notes, I just love this Bible. Yeah, really. <laughs> It's like, it's all marked. I can't start over. Cometh this blessed is this? I'm tongue-tied this morning. Verse 9. Does this blessedness then come on the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And how then was it reckoned unto him? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision but an uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, which is a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. <clears throat> so Abraham was 
right before God before he was ever circumcised. And this is a big point in the time that Paul is writing this because at that time, the Judaizers were out there and there's a whole lot that goes into that that I won't cover right now because that's not the point. But the point is that before he was circumcised, he was righteous before God because he believed God and that was accounted to him for righteousness. I'm, I'm going to hammer that point to you. I, I was taught at a young age, there's three elements that make up faith. Number one, you have to be aware. You have to be aware of a promise to have faith in what that promise is. Number two, you have to believe in that promise. You have to believe that that promise is true. And then the third element, you have to depend upon it. And you have, so you have to be aware of, believe in, and depend on the promise of God to have faith in the promise of God. That's what I was taught as a young, as a young man. How then was it reckoned? Not when he was in circumcision. And that was the big thing of the day. So he received the sign of circumcision. That he might be the father of those that believe, whether they're circumcised or not. It's not the, circumcision is not the point. Baptism is not the point. Uh, you know, if you were in the New Testament and you were not baptized, you, you, you weren't necessarily not saved, but they would certainly challenge your commitment to Christ because that's a point of obedience. And so there are things that we do in the church. I grew up in the Quaker church. Anybody here ever heard of the Quaker church? Yeah. The Quaker church, it, modern term, is the Friends Church. <clears throat> and uh, they got the name, by the way, because George Fox, they said he was quaking in his boots. I'm convinced George Fox was Pentecostal. I mean, this guy was on fire. This guy went around. But one of the things he realized that a lot of people, you know, were, were having to be baptized and having... So what he said was, he said, I'm not going to baptize anybody. I mean, even Paul said in, to the Corinthians, I'm, glad, I'm thankful that I baptized only a few of you guys because there was dissension. Well, I'm a following Paul. Well, I'm following Apollos. Well, I'm following the true Jesus. Oh, my. So there was all this dissension going on. And what Paul says... Uh, well, he, what, what, what George Fox did was, he said, I'm not going to baptize anybody, and I'm not going to have communion, because I want people to understand that it's by faith alone that you receive salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, of course, the Quaker Church adopted those as their tradition. So at the Quaker Church, we never did baptisms, and we never did communion. So, I'm not sure that's right or wrong, but that's, it is what it is, and I understand the purpose behind it. So, he is the father of circumcision to those who are not of the circumcision only, but to, who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm just going to take the lid off of this thing so I can grab and drink. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed, through the law. It was not because of the law. But through the righteousness of faith. I love the way that's worded. Through the righteousness of faith. Not through the righteousness of Abraham. Because it wasn't Abraham's righteousness. He had the faith. And because of the faith. God was able to declare him righteous. Because he exercised his faith. For if they which are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect, because the law works wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to that which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. This is interesting. I, I think sometimes we <clears throat> go a little far in our declarations and take scriptures out of context. And pardon me if I step on your toes, but there are several things that bother me in 
God said of David, he is a man after my own heart. And God was the one that was able to say that. David never said that about himself. He was pursuing God. He had a relationship with God. When he sinned, he repented. So that to me was why God was able to say he's a man after my own heart. You can't take that title on yourself. <clears throat> and a lot of times we want to take some of these titles to ourselves. The Bible says that Abraham walked with God and he was a friend of God. <clears throat> Abraham never said that about himself. But, of course, Jesus, on the other hand, in the New Testament, said, I've called you friends. So, yes, we are friends of God. And here, I want to pick this verse apart. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. God said that of Abraham. Abraham had no descendants at the time. But God said, I will make you a father of many nations. And it, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? We can see that God has made Abraham father of many nations. So God fulfilled his promise. Before whom he believed. Even God. So he's talking about Abraham believed God. And then he says what God says. God who quickens the dead. It's God that does that, right? God, who calls those things which be not as though they were. I'm not sure we have the ability to speak of those things that are not as though they were. And, I, and I'm going to put a context to this. When God created the heavens and the earth, He did it with His Word. Everything God did, He did with His Word. He speaks, and something happens. And the interesting thing about God is He is not limited with time-space. God is the creator of time space. We are finite, so we don't understand this. I can go into a whole philosophic difference between secular humanism of today and Christianity and, and, and what we have in God without doing that. But I want to touch on this one here for a second because I want you to understand that God speaks of those things that are not as though they were because God created the time, space, timeline. So God sees the end as clear as he sees the beginning. We can only look behind and see clear. And the only way that we can go to the future and follow God is by the help of the Holy Spirit. Because only he can see the future. But he sees the future as clear as the past. We can't understand that. Because we're finite, we're limited, and we don't have that ability to see. <clears throat> as an example, there are a lot of computer games out there. And the creator of those computer games, when they get done with that game, they created the game from the beginning to the ending. And they know every step of the way through the game because they took the time, however long it took, to make and create and build the game so that when you get in the game, you've got to work your way through the game, fight whatever you have to fight, go through whatever tunnels or whatever there is to get to the end. You have to discover the end. They already know it because they created it. In the same way, I know it's a sad analogy, but tough nudgies. In the same way, God built time space. And he built it in a limited sphere of time and space. And he sees the beginning, the beginning and he sees the end. I, I want to drive that home because only faith in God can carry you through this life to the ultimate end of victory. And... I got a lot going through my head right there. So God calls those things that are not as though they were. God told Abraham, you will be a father of many nations, and it was not at that time. But God saw the future. God had a plan. God knew what he spoke. God told David, you will be king. He knew what he spoke. David knew he wasn't going to die because God had already anointed him king. God already spoke that into his life. And so Abraham and David both believed God. And their belief, not their actions, counted as righteousness in the face of God. Now their belief changed their actions. So I'm not denoting throwing actions out the door. Because you have to walk as if you believe what God said is true. And many of you have heard from God. And haven't seen the promise yet. And I want to urge you this morning to take this story. And understand that when God speaks. God intends it to happen. Now 
What would, Ab- what would have happened in Abraham's life if he had lost his faith? If he had doubted God? We don't know because he didn't, thank goodness. And what will happen in my life if I take what God said to me and I... Well, it wasn't God. The circumstances kind of change, outweigh, and kind of... We, we have a tendency as human beings to take and kind of brush over that which God has spoken and just, well, did God really say? And that's the nature of human beings. And that started in the garden. Did God re- actually say you would not die? Challenge the word. Challenge what was spoken. So here we are. God who quickens the dead. That, that was one of the reasons why Paul was kicked out of uh, Athens when he was standing in Athens and speaking to the philosophers of the day. They listened to him pretty intently. And some believed. But when he spoke of the resurrection, that's when they stopped him. Okay, that's enough. You cross the line. Because only God can do that. God who quickens the dead and speaks as those things that are not as though they were, God can only do that too. Because God knows. And so I'm trying to urge you, what God has spoken to you, God intends to fulfill. Don't let go of it. Let your faith be strong circumstances cannot stop the word of God. God will change the circumstances in his timing as he needs to to accomplish his will in your life. Stand strong. Stand on your faith. Who against hope believed in hope. Now he's talking about Abraham again. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. That's another key word. Spoken. How did God create He spoke. He spoke the world into existence. God spoke. Boy, you think people listen when E.F. Hutton talks? When God speaks, things happen. And being not weak in faith, he did not consider his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And we're just talking about his first child. We're just talking about the birth. We aren't even talking about when he's up on the hill told to sacrifice him. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness, What was? What was imputed to Abraham for righteousness? His pay, his belief. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Abraham did not stagger at the promise. And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, what about when Sarah brought in Hagar? Isn't it easy for us to compromise when somebody else says, it's okay to do this? And somehow, that falls into the plan of God, too. Because not only is he the father of the children of Israel, but since Sarah brought him Hagar... He becomes the father of a whole other line of people. And they still can't get along today. And they don't understand this is a family feud. It's a shame. But they're all the children of Abraham. And they're the children of a very faithful man. A man that shows us that when God speaks, you can't walk away from it. You can't let it go. Because God doesn't say anything... There's one word, and I always say this, that is not in God's vocabulary. Oops. God does not say oops. God does not make mistakes. God has said what he has said and intends it to come to pass. 
And so just like a player of the game that's going to go to the end, they have to fall. God has called us to walk in faith, to hear what it is he has said to us as a group in the Word and as individuals in our own prayer time and walk it out by faith and believe that God is faithful to perform what he said he would do. God is a powerful God. Just the word God means that he created the heavens and the earth, means that he is an eternal being. We can't understand this because we're finite. What does that mean? Mathematically, we are limited. And there's only so much that we can think. There's only so far we can go with our knowledge and our understanding. Some go further than others. Some study, 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 study. And they've acquired a lot in that head. And they've, they've got a lot of knowledge. And they they're, but having said that, they still are finite. And one of the problems with humanism and the mathematic impossibility of man, because humanism says that man is the center. And man, beginning from himself, and a projection of all man together, will acquire all the answers to all of life and all of knowledge. It's impossible. Because matter and energy are eternal. And we are not. And when you start with a finite, you can never become, get to an eternal. You can never get to an infinite. It's just like one of the problems with evolution. You can't draw life from non-life. That's been proven for over a hundred and some years. That life does not come from non-life. And if there was ever a time when nothing existed, what could possibly exist today? So something cannot come from nothing. And there was never a time when nothing existed because even in modern science and philosophy, they understand that something has existed forever. Therefore, the argument is no longer, you say God existed forever, ha, ha, ha. The argument is, its origin and its present state. Is it a personal or an impersonal beginning? And if you, in your prayer time, and I know a lot of you have a relationship with God, you understand the personalness of the Christian faith. Jesus died on the cross to save you and to save me. And it's not because we were worth it. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Those of you that have heard from God, that have a word from God, I urge you, stand in faith, because when God speaks, He does not lie, He does not trick, and He does not say oops. He knows exactly what He's doing. And those of you that maybe are new to Christian faith, understand, or maybe haven't even been saved, understand that it doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, this salvation is for you. This relationship to God was given to us by Jesus Christ. Amen. By His sacrifice. The, by, everybody quotes John 3.16. I love John 3.17. Yeah. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Yeah. But that the world through Him would be saved. <laughs> That's the love of God, people. The blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. We see in the garden. When they sinned, they put leaves on themselves to cover themselves up. What did God do? God put fur on them. And God was the first one to shed blood because God had the principle down that without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. And all of what we see in the law and the prophets in the Old Testament with the sacrifices and with all of this stuff was a type of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, these were a shadow and it says that Jesus Christ is the substance that casts the shadow. Our faith is in something solid. Our faith is in something, is in someone that has spoken. And we see through history and through the word that it is real. And it is as he said it would be. And that is the God that we serve. God loves you and God loves me unconditionally. And he always will. And he's always able to change the circumstance, to change the, take the sin away. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It says in the scripture, it, it, God has done much for all of us. And no matter where you are in your walk in life, 
this morning, stand in faith. Believe what God said. And don't let go of the promises of God. Jesus Christ loves you for who you are. God created every one of us. David said, I was fearfully and wonderfully made in my mother's womb. I, I don't understand how doctors and people that go through medical school can look at all the complexity of our bodies and not believe in God. I've heard several people write articles saying, how in the world can any of my constituents not see God's hand in, all, in the eyeball, just the eyeball, the complexity of what makes that thing work? It, it is astounding. The ability for our body to heal itself when it's cut or whatever. It's, there, there is so many signs of God all around us. And we understand, you know, why do bad things? I, my first thought in doing my sermon last week for, for today was, why do good things happen to uh, bad things happen to good people? <clears throat> and I have a whole series of things because I'm trying to find, you know, what's really happening? I, I really want to understand clearer. And I understand that God, who is in charge, this world has, the authority of this world was given to mankind. God told Adam, you, you subdue the earth. But when the, the enemy deceived him, the enemy usurps authority. And he's been usurping authority ever since. And it's our faith in God and it's our belief in God and our denial to back down and walk away from what God has said that's going to get us to the end result that God wants to take us. And so that is my sermon this morning. I just want to try to inject in you more faith, understanding of Jesus and what he really means to us, to the Christian, to the body of Christ, and to this world. Jesus is the answer. And there is no circumstance that can take away what God has promised and what God has done. And so this morning, I, I just, I, I hope that I was able to communicate to you faith in a, in a different way maybe with a few examples that can touch our own lives and help us to see clearer that God has a plan and God's plan is not going to fail I have failed God in the past you have failed God in the past we, we all fall short, amen but that doesn't mean that the plan has changed so I just want to pray over you this morning. Lord God, I thank you for this house. I thank you for these people, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for... Lord, there's so many needs in here. Every individual has needs. Every individual has something needs to happen in their life. <clears throat> A lot of people, Lord God, have heard from you. And you've given them words. And you've spoken. And you said, I am going to. I am going to. I, and Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would rise up faith in this house. Lord God, you've given words over this house. Lord God, your intent, Lord, is to move mightily through this city, through this house. And I pray and ask in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that those here and those on YouTube that watch this video, Lord, that you would help us to understand, Lord, and move back into the place where we are seeking you and we are hearing from you and we are trusting you that what you said you were accomplished Lord in our lives as individuals and as a church together I thank you Jesus that you said my sheep know me and they hear my voice and I believe Lord God that you are not silent you still speak help us to hear help us God to tune in to you to what you would have us do and I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that each person here as we go forth this week, that we would go forth in faith, that we would go forth with, with a focus and with a resolution to stand and believe and walk out what you've called us to do, that God, your will would be done in our lives. I thank you for salvation. I pray for all those, Lord, that have not ever received Jesus. And I pray right now, Lord, and I'm going to ask everybody here to repeat after me because it's real simple to become a Christian. It's real simple, <coughs> but it does take confession. And God wants to hear your voice. And just repeat after me. 
Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for being resurrected that I might live a new life. I ask that you come into my life right now. I thank you that the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all my sin. And I ask that you would send the Holy Spirit into my heart. I ask that you would live through me. Help me to walk with the faith of Abraham. The faith that you give me. In Jesus' name, amen.